take this world, my God's enough. God, we thank you for uh, your many blessings to us. Lord, as we've just sang, uh, you are certainly enough. Uh, but God, you give us so many other blessings, so much uh, that you, uh, so many materialistic things that, that you entrust to us. Lord, finances, money, homes, uh, clothing, food, all these things are, are blessings. And, and Father, we're thankful for that. And God, it's a joy to be able to trust just a little bit back to you. And so we do that with our tithes and our offerings at this time. And we trust that you use them, Father, for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. If you will, take your copy of God's Word and turn to, uh, to John chapter 2 with me. John chapter 2. Uh, we're going to be in verses 23 through 25 this morning. John 2, 23 through 25 this morning. Ever, every now and again, you'll hear somebody utter words similar to these that, uh, that they are losing their faith in humanity. You ever heard that before? I'm losing my faith in humanity. That is a horrible, horrible place to put your faith by the way, man is basically good. That's another statement that you'll hear. Man is basically good. And that is a erroneous statement that is anti-biblical. And I want to show you that this morning. Answer the question, is man basically good? The answer is an emphatic no. Man is not basically good. Uh, but I want to I show you that in the scriptures this morning. In 2018, there was a CNN report that came out uh, where through something called the Wisdom Project, I don't think there was a lot of wisdom in it, to be honest, but... Uh, the, the article basically concluded that man is inherently good. Uh, we saw that in, in 2012. Uh, there, was a, there was a study, some scientists, uh, again, I, I kind of doubt the science, but uh, there were some scientists at Harvard and Yale that came together and did a study that, that concluded that man is, in fact, basically good. In 2014... Uh, the current president then, uh, President Obama, uh, said after a uh, race-related shooting, said that he believed that all Americans were basically good. And I think that he was wrong in that assessment of Americans. But it's not just something that is new to us. Uh, philosophers in the 18th century, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, said that man was basically good. Other philosophers, Thomas Hobbes and others, have said that man is inherently good, that there is good within mankind, and I will uh, expand on that idea just a, a little bit further in a few moments. Uh, but even, even way back before that, uh, even in the, the fourth century, people were, were essentially saying that mankind is good. And so, uh, so the bishop... Augustine uh, in North Africa, he, he wrote what was called his Confessions, which he laid out the doctrine of original sin and the depravity of the human condition. Now, I know that it is Valentine's Day, and I know that, that you're wanting, you know, the butterflies in the stomach kind of feeling today. I understand that. But I'm going to disappoint you this morning in that, that era, that, that area of your life. I will, I will allow uh, your spouse to, to get the butterflies and chocolate and the candy and the roses. And all that. That's up to y'all. Y'all do that, okay? 
But, but, but it being Valentine's Day, we are talking about the heart this morning, but it's not going to leave you in that mushy, gushy, ooey-gooey kind of feeling. The text this morning in, in, in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, is... Uh, is a small, small little section of scripture there that you probably don't hear a whole lot about. <clears throat> it serves very importantly, though. It's a bridge. It is a literary bridge, taking us from one idea to a, another idea. And so uh, John has, in chapter 2, John has given us two different signs of Christ, two different signs, two different miracles that Jesus performed. The, the, the wedding at Cana, and then the fulfillment of the prophecy when he cleansed the temple uh, there in Jerusalem at the Passover. And oftentimes this passage is kind of lumped on the heels of that cleansing of the temple. And I thought about that. I thought about preaching it in that regard. But I, I believe there's a doctrine that is presented in this passage, in these three verses, that is essential for understanding any, any of the gospel. For, for understanding what comes next. Now, chapter 3 of John's gospel is, is probably one of the most famous. There are several stories in, in John's gospel that, that are unique to John's gospel. That, in other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't give us these stories. Several of those in, in John's gospel. But chapter 3 is, is, is such a well-known passage of Scripture. I mean, that's where we get 316, Right? Y'all know John 3.16 is in John 3, okay? It's a, it's a famous passage of Scripture. This is the story of, of Nicodemus. And we're going to jump into that particular passage next Sunday, the story of Nicodemus. But in order to understand what John is saying in illustrating with Nicodemus in that account, we need to understand this doctrine that he's given us here. There is a reason John is including these three verses at this point in the text. It's a very specific reason. And so, we want to do a good job this morning understanding what John is, is, is telling us in this bridge, this bridge, literary bridge as I'm, I'm calling it. We are talking this morning about a particular doctrine, and the doctrine is human depravity. Human depravity. It's not necessarily an easy doctrine to grasp. It's, it's a doctrine that most people get a little bit offended by. It's a teaching, an idea that most people get a little bit upset about. But it is what the scriptures are clearly teaching, I believe. So let's read the passage together. John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now when he, that's Jesus, was in Jerusalem... At the Passover feast, we discussed that at length last Sunday. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. Father, would you bless the reading of your word this morning and bless the preaching of your word. In Christ's name, amen. Many people believed in his name when they saw the signs, plural, that he was doing. He was doing signs. There's a plural idea there. Now, if you back up to the wedding at Cana, verse 11 of chapter 2, John tells us that this was the first of his signs. There clearly were other signs happening that we just don't know about. If you believe that all that Jesus ever did during his earthly ministry is wrapped up and bound in these four gospels, you're mistaken. There's more. Jesus did a lot more. There are miracles that Jesus did then that you and I probably can't even fathom. Things that our imagination may not come up with. What we have is what God wanted us to have, inspired by his spirit and recorded in his word. But we understand that there were other things that Jesus was doing. Different miracles. The word signs means miracles. 
wonders, amazing things. And as people saw them, people believed in him, the Bible tells us. Now, that's important because that is the whole point of this book. I'm going to take you again to John chapter 20, near the ending of the book. In verse 31, the apostle tells us why he's written this book. And he says, but these are written so that you may believe. Believe what? Specifically that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so we've titled the entire series simply, Believe. The word believe appears over and over and over throughout this book. John is writing so that people would believe, and now we're told that people are believing in Jesus. But he's not entrusting himself to them. Now, the word entrust in verse 24 in the ESV, most translations We'll translate that with the word entrust or the word trust. The King James uses the word commit. It's a similar idea. Jesus is not trusting himself, committing himself to these people who are believing in his name. We need to examine and understand why is Jesus not entrusting himself. The word entrust, the word Uh, trust or commit in the Greek is actually the second time that this word is used in this passage. You'll see it in verse 24, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them. It's actually used in verse 23 too. The same word in the Greek language. In verse 23, where it says many believed in his name is the same word. The word believed in verse 23 and the the word entrust in verse 24 are the same word in the Greek language. It's the same idea, believe. And so essentially, what John is telling us is that the people believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not believe in their believing. That's a tongue twister. Let me say it one more time. The people believed Jesus, but Jesus did not believe their believing in him. Why? Why, 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 why would John say that they believe If Jesus doesn't believe their belief, verse 24 and verse 25 tell us why. And twice John tells us why. Verse 24, he says, because he, Jesus, knew all people. Jesus did not trust himself. Jesus did not believe their belief because he knew all people. In verse 25, he himself knew what was in man. He knew all people, and then he knew what was in man. Again, the word knew comes up twice here. Knowledge. Jesus has a particular knowledge that informed him, and because of Jesus' knowledge of all people, because Jesus knew what was in man, John tells us Jesus did not trust them. Jesus has an intimate knowledge of mankind. How do we know this? Well, he is omniscient, which means that he knows all things. Jesus knows everything, so yes, he knows mankind. He knows all people. He knows what is in man. He's also their creator. So these very people who are believing in Jesus... Jesus created them. He knows them intimately. In Psalm 139, the psalmist tells us in verse 15, My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. In John chapter 1, even, if we just go back a page in John's gospel, in John chapter 1, in verse 3, the Bible tells us that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That includes mankind. John is identifying Jesus as the creator, and in that statement, he is including all of man. All things includes human beings. 
It includes the human heart. It includes the human mind. It includes the human intellect, the the tongue, the language, the behavior, the emotions, everything. Jesus says, or John tells us that Jesus knew what was in mankind. Verse 25. He's, He's identifying something that is in man. So what is in man that Jesus would know that would that would that would cause Jesus not to trust mankind? Let's talk about that. What is in man? I'm gonna take you on a on a on a on a run this morning in the Bible. Most of these will be on the screen, but I would encourage you to at least jot them down and go back and look them up later, or, at least, or, or try to look them up now. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse number 9, the Bible tells us that the heart, which is in man, is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Hear those words from the prophet. The heart is deceitful. Not just somewhat deceitful, but deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. So that the prophet asked the question, who, who could ever understand it? Romans chapter 3, probably the most well-known passage to deal with the human condition. Romans chapter 1 through 3, Paul is setting the, the stage of just the, the sinfulness of mankind. And in chapter 3, uh, verses 10 through 18, Paul uh, is actually quoting several of the Psalms. So these are not words that he's just, just coming up with in the moment. But, but, but the Apostle Paul is, is, is using the Psalms, using the Old Testament. And he's, he, he's describing the human condition. So in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, he says, As it is written, again, quoting, quoting from the Psalms, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. I mean, just before I continue the next seven verses, just, just hear the, the inclusivity that Paul is using here. He's not excluding anybody from this. And the, the world wants inclusivity, correct? Right? Everybody wants to be included. Okay, well, congratulations. We're all included in our sinful condition. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I I tried to warn you that this would not be the Sunday to leave you with the butterflies in your stomach. It's not this you're a good person stuff. There are churches that you can walk into, probably even today, probably even in our area, that would tell you just how great of a person you really are. And they would pat you on the back and try to build your self-esteem and just send you out just all feeling wonderful about yourself. Unfortunately, this is not one of those. Simply because the Bible does not do that. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, the, the Apostle Paul again says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins. Dead. Get, get, get that idea, the finality of death. This is what the human condition is. This is the result of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. We have inherited their sin. It's called original sin. It is the doctrine of depravity. Now, maybe you've heard a phrase. Maybe you've heard it described as total depravity. Let's talk about that for just a quick moment. What is total 
depravity. What are we saying and what are we not saying when we talk about this? Well, we are not saying that people are the worst that they possibly could be. Sometimes it's often thought that. Well, if we're totally depraved, then we're saying that everybody's just as bad as they possibly could be. No, they're not. By God's grace, you're nowhere near as bad as you could be. And I, and I promise you, I'm nowhere near as bad. Even in my, my, my pre-saved condition, before God saved me, was not as bad as I possibly could be. I could always be a little bit worse. That's called God's restraining grace on humanity. God's common grace across humanity is that people are not as bad as they possibly could be. We're thankful for that. So when we see the, the, the depravity and the sinfulness of humanity around us, understand it could be worse. Even, even the regimes, the, the communist regimes and the dictatorships and the, the tyranny around the world could be worse than they actually are. By God's grace, they're not. Are we saying that there is nothing good to say about mankind? No, we're not saying that either. We're not saying that there is absolutely nothing good about man. Man can do relatively good things. Relatively good things, good deeds. It's relative. But the heart of man is sinful. The heart of man is, is depraved. Even when we do good deeds, so often we do them from such sinful motivations, don't we? Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me whenever I do something good. I'm just maybe sometimes thinking, I hope so-and-so sees me do this. Come on now. Let's not, let's not, let's not lie to each other. Am I alone in that? Y'all do good stuff, right? If, if you knew that your wife wasn't watching, right? If you didn't have the little, your little security camera up on your phone and you knew she wasn't spying on you in the kitchen, you wouldn't have washed those dishes. Come on, guys, right? We do good things hoping somebody's going to see us and pat us on the back to get us ahead. You wouldn't have put in that overtime at work if you knew that the that the boss wasn't going to know that it was specifically you that did that report and that it wasn't going to put you and it would put you in a position for a promotion down the road? We're not saying that, the, that, that mankind can't do anything good. Mankind can do good things, but the heart of man is wicked. We're not saying that man is inherently worthless, like that, has, that man has no worth whatsoever. That would go against the very fact that God created mankind in his, in his image, the Imago Dei. God's created us in his image. Our worth is in our creation. We're not saying that fallen people are never good in any respect. Please, please hear that. Rather, this doctrine says that fallen people are never completely and totally good. That we are never good in every single respect. This, this is not new. Protestants have understood this for uh, going on 400 years. We've, we've, we've over 400 years. We've, we've figured, we've, we've gotten this idea. In the 1600s, in the 1646, the, the Presbyterian church came together and, 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 and wrote a confession of faith that Presbyterians still hold today. Centuries later, still use that, that same confession. In 1646. In 1689, Baptists across England came together in London. And they, they wrote a, a confession of faith very similar to the one that the, the Presbyterians had. And in both of those confessions, which Baptists still use today, in both of those confessions of faith, they use the words holy defiled, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y, whole, the whole of something. Holy defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. That's the, that's the way. So, so instead of using the words totally depraved, they use the words holy defiled. We are defiled in our whole. All of our being is defiled. American Baptist in 1833 in their confession in New Hampshire, which many still hold to today, 
said that mankind is wholly given to the gratification of the world, of Satan, and of their own sinful passions. Our own Baptist faith and message from the year 2000 in Southern Baptist doesn't say it quite with the same words, but gets the point across. It says, through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity, that's us, inherit a nature and an environment inclined toward sin. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. Only the grace of God can bring man into his holy fellowship and enable man to fulfill the creative purpose of God. One theologian summarizes it this way. It's not that we have no good things in us. That's not what we're saying. It's that the good things that God put in us have all become spoiled. Think about that. It's not that we have no good things in us. It's that the good things that God put in us have all become spoiled. Somebody once said a little leaven affects everything. Our hearts, our intellects, our emotions, our desires, our wills, our bodies, our souls, our spirits, sin corrupts the whole, the totality of who we are. No, Jesus did not entrust himself to man because he knew what was in man. Man is depraved. But the heart of man is also deceitful. That was the word from Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? What does deceitful mean? It means to, to avoid the truth, to mislead in the truth. This is why Jesus did not believe them. It is, the heart is misleading. The heart is misleading. Elsewhere, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus would tell a parable. I won't read the entire passage, but I do want to read the parable. I won't read the meaning of it because Jesus later expounds and explains the meaning of this parable. But, but I think you can see some of the deceit of the heart of man. In Mark chapter 4, verse 1, again, he began te to teach beside the sea. Very, loud, very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and he sat in it on the sea and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, look, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose and it was scorched and since it had no root, it withered away. Yet other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into the good soil and produced grain. Growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and even a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Of course, Jesus is talking about the, re the receptivity of the heart of man. He's talking about man's uh, reception of the gospel of Jesus. And he later tell explains that in Mark chapter 4. He explains the meaning of the parable. And Jesus says there are four types of soil that are described. The soils represent the human heart. In some situations, when you sow the gospel, the seed falls on the path and the birds come down and devour it. And it takes no root whatsoever in the soil, in the heart of man. Yet there are other instances where it's kind of like rocky ground and you throw the seed out. And there's a little bit of dirt there, so it begins to grow. But as soon as you get a hot noonday sun that comes out, it just withers it away because there is no depth of the root. And there's some soil that, 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 that things grow there, but unfortunately thorns grow there too. 
And so as the, as the, 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 the gospel is growing, the thorns will choke it out. But one in four is good soil where, where the, 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 the fruit grew and increased and eventually yielded a fantastic harvest. One in four of the tops of soil. Listen, some of them looked really good. Three of the four looked great. I mean, the, the, the rocky ground, I mean, is, look, it may just spring right up. Fantastic. Hey, we got, a, we got a crop. If you've ever gardened, you've probably had some of those that just shoot up, and they look fantastic. And then, for whatever reason, a week or so later, you go out, and it's just it's, it's withering, it's wilting, it's dying, and you can't figure out why. And if, you, if you've ever had a garden, you know, you know how, how miserable the thorny ground is. You know how miserable the weeds are. I mean, man, if you're not constantly plucking the weeds and guarding against the weeds in your garden, the weeds will overcome your garden. The thorns will choke out the life of the produce. It may have went a little deeper, but there were too many thorns there, and it just choked them out. And we've all known people like that. Surely you have. If you've grown up in church life, if you've been in the church at any time at all, you, you've, you've encountered this. I have as a pastor. I've met with people who, who walk down the aisle and, 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 and pray and, and, and the tears flow and, and we have this conversation about the gospel and they come in a week later and we talk more about the gospel and we talk about how the gospel can change their lives and they, they, they pray a prayer and, if, and a month or two later we go to the baptistry and we baptize them and then they come in, they, 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 you know, they, they, they take up the offering, or they sing in the choir, they do this, they do that. And in six months' time, I I'm, 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 I'm show up on Sunday morning, I'm looking for them, and I don't see them. I don't see them next Sunday, and I don't see them the next Sunday. And months go by, and eventually they're not answering my calls anymore, you know, because they're, they're, they're tired of making up excuses. I mean, y'all know, y'all know how that is when the pastor calls, right? Some people have a list of them. And they kind of run out of them, and, and, and so they just, quit, they just quit answering my calls. They quit responding to text messages. A year goes by. At this point, I've kind of, kind of, they flipped my mind. I'll run into them at McDonald's or somewhere. Hey, man, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, I've been meaning to get back up there. Great, I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> nope. Right, I mean, we've seen that. We've seen it where it springs up and, and looks promising. It looks wonderful. But the sun gets it, or the thorns got it. I don't know which it is all the time. But I know that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. It's not the last time that we're going to have to deal with this in the Gospel of John, just FYI. It's not the last time you're going to see this kind of language in the Gospel of John. I'm going to tell you, buckle up, because when we get to John chapter 6, It gets really rough. In John chapter 6, Jesus says in verse 63, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Listen, for Jesus, this is John's parenthetical commentary, For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, and he knew who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples, many of those who were following him, turned back and no longer walked with him. Their belief was the same belief that these in John chapter 2 were holding to. It was not a belief that Jesus trusted. So if the heart of man is depraved and is, is deceptive, then how can a man possibly be saved? That is, that is the question. 
if this is accurate, if this belief here is not adequate, why not? What is the problem here? The Bible says many believed in his name. But they believed when they saw signs. What if Jesus hadn't have done those signs? Would they have believed in him? I don't think so. What if Jesus had not multiplied the bread and the fish and filled their bellies? What if he had not touched the lame and the leper and the blind and ridded them of their afflictions? What if he had not touched the man's little girl and brought her back to life? What if he had not cast the demons out? Would people still believe in him? So we see a lot of this in our day and age. There are many who believe. Overwhelmingly, many who will claim faith in Christianity. But I don't know that Jesus would entrust himself to them. There are those who... What we call today, our, our terminology is the prosperity gospel. Preacher will preach health, wealth, and prosperity. Good health and good money if you'll trust Jesus. Of course they're going to say we believe in Jesus. Of, who wouldn't? I mean, come on, guys. If, 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 if the pastor who you have a, a, a bad theology of anyway, not you specifically, but, but American Christianity has a bad theology of anyway and thinks that somehow I'm closer to Jesus than, than you are. If, if the man who's more righteous than thou says, if, if you will just trust God with this much money, he'll, he'll multiply it a hundredfold. He'll give you all kinds. You, man, you'll be driving that Mercedes Benz you've always looked, dreamed of. Or that sports car, that Ferrari you've always had your eyes set on and your heart set on. Just trust God. Trust Jesus. I mean, man, if I actually thought that was real, I mean, like, yeah. Sign me up. I believe. I'll send you my 20 bucks. That's going to be the return. And they view it as more of an investment, a financial decision, or a medical decision to trust in Jesus than they do a spiritual decision. I mean, let's just, let's just get really, really, really frank. We can go to the book of James in chapter 2 and say, where James tells us that even the demons believe in Jesus, right? I mean, Satan believes in Jesus. I mean, I mean you, you understand, it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. So does Satan. He gets it. He trusts Jesus. He trusts that Jesus is going to come back. He trusted God was going to send a Messiah. That's why he spent the entire Old Testament for centuries trying to stop that plan. That's why he killed numerous baby boys in the Nile River trying to get rid of Moses. That's why he killed numerous baby boys in Bethlehem when Jesus was born trying to stop the plan of God because he believed God. So you say, I believe in God. Good for you. So do, the, so, do the, so do the demons. So what's our hope? I mean, man, I, I've, I feel like I've beat you up today. I'm sorry. Somebody's leaving with, with your toes broke and your black, and black eyes. You know, I, I get it. So what's our hope? Well, that's what John's doing in John chapter 3. He's setting us up for John chapter 3. For a word that we call Regeneration. It's a theological word. It's a big word. Regeneration. What does generation mean? Not, not a people, not an age group so much. To generate something means to create something or make something. To cause something to come about. So regenerate means to generate again or to cause something in, to come into a renewed existence. One Bible dictionary says it this way, the transformation of a person's spiritual condition from death to life through the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 3, in verse 3. You can just simply move your eyes down the page and see it with me. 
Jesus answered Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot, there is an emphatic will not, see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, unless one is recreated, rebirthed, renewed, regenerated, one cannot see the kingdom of God. Here's the point. Because the heart cannot be trusted, it must be remade. The heart cannot be trusted, therefore it must be remade. In Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophet Ezekiel records these words. God says, I will give you a new heart. Man, that's good news, isn't it? After, after today, I'm sitting here thinking, man, I need a new heart. God says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit that I will put in you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Man, that's good news. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You not just made a commitment, you've been recreated. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. That's what chapter three and chapter four are all about. You say, chapter 4, what's that? That's when Jesus meets this really, really sinful woman at the well. Been married five times, living with a guy she's not even married to now. All of humanity despises her, rejects her, and casts her out. And Jesus says, believe in me. Not for the signs, not for the wonders. Trust that I will create in you a new heart and a new spirit. Trust that in me is the living water that will never run dry. Jesus says. Jesus is preparing us. Listen, don't miss chapter 2, verses 23 and 25, through 25 before you head into 3 and 4. Don't miss it. He's setting us up to understand Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus has a heart that is depraved. Because Nicodemus has a heart that is deceitful. Because the woman at the well, her biggest issue is not her marriage and her love life. That's not her problem. Her problem is her heart. And Jesus is setting her up. And he's setting the reader up to understand that our biggest issue, it's not our money. It's not your wealth. It's not your health. Listen, COVID, as bad as I hate it, I promise you that's not our biggest issue. It's just not. American politics is not your biggest issue problem in life. Your religious liberty is not your biggest problem in life. And some of you today, men especially, I fear are going to have problems when you get home because you forgot that it was Valentine's Day. But I assure you that that is not your biggest problem. That is not your biggest problem. Your rebellious teenager, your rebellious grandchildren, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, your government, none of this is your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is your heart, the heart of man. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, that when we come to the end of ourself, we come to the beginning of Christ. When we come to the end of self, we come to the beginning of Jesus I pray that that's what this has done for you this morning, that these words of Jesus, when we look into what is in man, that Jesus would know what is in man, would bring you that to that point, to the end of everything that you are, to where that you no longer trust in you and you can begin to trust in Jesus. I grew up in the, uh, in the 80s and the 90s. And one of the popular things for celebrities to, to do was to, to be role models. And, and their, their message then wasn't quite what it is now. They still are role models, though poor ones often. Their message now is, is 
very social justice, politically charged. Their message then wasn't quite so. Their message then was simply just do what your heart tells you to do. Follow your heart. You know, follow your heart. If you want to shoot for the stars, shoot for the stars. Follow your heart. And, and, and then, I, I, I really believe that even then, some of them saying those words could not have imagined where that would actually lead people. When we follow our heart today, then, then essentially if my heart says I want to be a different gender, if I want to even make up my own gender, which you can do these days, then, then you can do that. That's where following your heart will get you. If you're telling your kids to follow your heart, stop. Just stop. Don't teach your kids to follow their heart. It is deceptive above all things. It will mislead you. Let me conclude with, with two philosophers, two different stories. One is the 4th century bishop, Augustine. He wrote a book called Confessions, very well known, one of the, just a classic of Christianity. You should read it sometime. Augustine tells the story in his Confessions of being with a group of his peers, young people. They were youth. And one night they were out and they raided a neighbor's garden. And they took his pears. They, they, they stole pears out of this fellow's garden. And Augustine, in his confession, says, you know, they, they weren't, they didn't look that good. And frankly, they didn't even taste that good. Honestly, Augustine says, I had better pears, better quality pears in my own garden that I, I could, have, could have taken without any consequence. But being in the group and feeling the peer pressure, I went with my buddies and we raided the garden and we all laughed and we had a good time. And then the pears didn't taste good, so we fed them to the pigs and we laughed some more. Every one of us in here has been a teenager can relate to something along those lines. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, in the 18th century, wrote a book also entitled Confessions. And he tells of a local man who persuaded him to steal the, the, the man's mother's asparagus. So this man came to him and said, you're young and, and you can get away with this. Go steal my mother's asparagus and you can sell it and make a profit off of it. You can make some money. And so Rousseau did. He stole the asparagus. Now here's the, here's the difference. Both men in philosophy are, are saying, we did this. They're confessing something wrong that they did. And neither of them argue that it was wrong. The difference, though, is that Augustine credits his actions to the sheer sinful delight to be had in breaking the law. Augustine says, I was wicked and I'm a sinner and I just enjoy doing something wrong. But not Rousseau. Rousseau argued that his motivation was not actually greed. He says that his motivation was simply obliging the person who made him to do it. So in other words, he's now blame shifting. If that doesn't sound familiar, you should read Genesis 3 this afternoon. Thus, he says, the act was driven not by some inward impulse that was intrinsically sinful, but by a good desire that led him to perform a sinful act. Don't miss that. He says it was a good desire that led him to perform a sinful act. He stole the asparagus to help his friend. So as long as you're doing it for a good reason, then do it. Rousseau believes that human corruption is a social condition. That we're corrupt because of, the, because of the environment. Because of all the pressures of the world, we do bad things, though we're not really bad people. <coughs> Carl Truman sums it up this way. He says, for Augustine, the moral flaw is ultimately intrinsic to himself. He is by nature wicked and a sinner. Circumstances merely provided an opportunity for a particular action to reveal the Im immorality of his innate inner disposition and his answerable to an external law. 
Indeed, a law grounded in the being of God. Which his sinful will takes a strange, perverse delight in breaking. For Rousseau, though, by way of contrast, his natural humanity is fundamentally sound. And the sinful act comes from social pressures and social conditioning. He becomes depraved by the pressures that society places on him. We might therefore summarize the basic difference between the two men as follows. Augustine blames himself for his sin because he is basically wicked from birth, while Rousseau blames society for his sin because he is basically good at birth, but then perverted by the external forces. And my question that I leave you with is who do you blame? Are you pinning everything and all your sin on the world? It's the government's fault that I, that I do this, or it's, it's my brother and sister's fault that I, that I got in a fight. Come on, we've all done that as kids. We grew up blaming the social conditions. If you got siblings, you blame the social conditions of your, of your home for your sin. It's their fault. And now we live with a generation that blames mama and daddy and says it's their fault that I'm like this and I turned out this way. Or they blame the teacher who was too hard on them or not hard enough or whatever. And the Bible says, suck it up and blame yourself that there is sin within. It's not everybody else's problem. It's my heart's problem. That's the problem of my sin. That's why I'm a sinner. Not because of anybody else. And there are even those just corrupt enough to actually blame God. God made me do it. God made me this way. God created me like this. And they blame their sinful life on the creator of the universe who created them in his image. Who do you blame? Your heart is wholly defiled, but God, being rich in mercy, can make you new. That's the good news. The news is this. If God doesn't do it, it can't be done. If God doesn't save you, it can't be done. Our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because we alone are sinners and responsible for our sin. Somebody here needs to trust Jesus today. Somebody needs to repent. Somebody needs to get their heart right with the Lord. Somebody needs to be born again. I can't actually do that. I'm sorry. The Spirit of God can, though. The Spirit of God can make you new again. I don't know who you are, and I don't know where you're at in your spiritual walk. But I, but I trust that if God is dealing with you, then he's going to deal with you. In John 6, Jesus is clear. The flesh is no help at all, and no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him. My friend, if the Father is drawing you, please, let's talk about that. Let's pray about that. The Spirit of God is stirring in you, creating in you something new. I want to talk to you about that and help you with that. I'm going to ask our praise team to come. And we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to, I, listen, I just want you to listen. It's a new song. We've done it two or three times as a, as a church. Just listen. In fact, Mark, if it's okay, brother, can you guys just sing? And we're going to stay seated for just a minute and just listen. Hear the words. They simply say this. My sins are many. Friend, you've got to start there and confess that. Admit that you're a sinner. Confess your sin before Almighty God that you are, in fact, depraved and deceitful. Confess your sins that there are many. But the good news is God's mercy is so much more than our sins. So much more. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And at times, God, your word is so painful to hear because it offends us, it offends our, our, our what we think is goodness. It hurts our pride to admit that we are sinners and we do need a Savior. So God, forgive us, but thank you for giving us your word. God, for the one here this morning who's, Lord, who's either, who's either never trusted you or maybe has but has strayed so far away. God, for the teenager Who's, who's trying to figure out 
all the things of the world and trying to figure out who they are. God, will you let them know that they, they are yours? That's who they are. Quit defining all their life by all of the junk in the world, but by you and your word. God, do a work in somebody's heart this morning, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You just sit there and pray and listen to this song as we sing. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is could remember no wrongs we have done. A mission all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Listen, we're going to sing one more, one more verse of that here in just a second. But I just can't help but to think that there's somebody that just needs to repent of their sin. And I, you guys know me. I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind that I'm not going to drag this on forever. I'm not going to plead, beg you to make a decision. I don't, I don't do all that. But you, you've been confronted with hard truth this morning. At the very least... We should be praising the Lord God this morning. That for whatever reason, he saw me and he saved me. And I can't explain that. People want me to explain that all the time, why he saved me and he didn't save Joe. I don't know. I wouldn't have saved me. I know my heart a lot better than you do, and I'm telling you, it's ugly. It is ugly. I wouldn't have picked me out of the mud and the mire. I'd have left me alone. God saved me, and I'm thankful for that. The altar is open for one more verse. Let's just sing one more together. You pray with us. Let's pray where you're at. Praise the Lord. Repent. Whatever you need to do, you do it with the Lord God right now. Let's sing one more stanza. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cause. We stood need the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. 
Father in heaven, we thank you this morning. We bow before you, God, because you are holy. God, we are not. Lord, you have, God, you caught us out of the darkness and you transferred us from the domain of darkness to the dominion of your son, to the kingdom of your beloved son. For that, we give you praise. And God, if you never, ever did another thing for us, God, if you didn't give us food, you didn't give us water, if you didn't give us a home, clothing, material wealth, Lord, if you took everything from us, God, Lord, if you took our health from us, if you took our families from us, like Job, God, though you would even slay us, Yet we would praise you for life everlasting. We thank you, Lord. We love you this morning. We ask all of this by the only name by which men might be saved. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated for just a moment. make a couple of uh, quick, uh, seemingly quick announcements. Um, I think these are on the screen. Our, our, our kids and youth are um, singing, and we're thankful for that. Our, we got kids um, today at 1 o'clock, and they're going to be singing. I think me and Ruby, are, we're going gonna, gonna, to gonna have our kids, if they're ready, we're going to have them up here singing next Sunday morning, which I'm looking forward to, but that means that they got to come practice today. So... Um, if they don't, then they don't sing next Sunday. So, um, so, so bring the kid, bring your kids in, and that's that's young kids, like four or five, up to about ten or eleven, I think, not in youth. And then our youth girls are practicing at two o'clock with Miss Annie. They're preparing for uh, for Easter, and so they'll be singing and and leading us in worship on Easter. And I'm looking forward to that as well. So get them here this afternoon. Our ladies' retreat is uh, is coming soon. It, well, it's not coming soon, but you got to pay soon. Um, you need to get your deposit in. And listen, just, just to help, help Miss Yvette clear up some, uh, some uh, uh, confusion, when you call and say, I'm signing up, okay, that's one thing. But then, you know, three months later, four months later, when it's time for the retreat, you forgot you did that, and we've got a spot for you and all this kind of stuff, then we're out. So when you call and say, I'm signing up, do that with a $30 deposit. Um, and if that is problematic for anybody, please, all you got to do is, is confidentially let me know, and I promise I can, I can assure you I can help you with that. Um, but, but when you sign up for something, do it with the deposit because, frankly, money talks. So there you go. Um, so um, And then uh, lastly, I'll just say this one more time. I, um, I'm asking your children, um, if you like the Luther videos and you've got kids, if you like it for your kids, help me out here and do some Ask Luthers. Um, I, got, I got one this week after asking last Sunday, and I'm thankful for that. Luther will be coming back into the, uh, to the, the recording studio, makeshift youth room, and, um, and we're going to um, uh, be doing some videos here in the next few weeks, and so I'm trying to get some more Ask Luthers to come in. Um, so, so bring those in. Those are, those are just, it helps me and Luther out um, quite a bit for you to do that. 
more than you know, actually. Um, and so, so if you'll do that, I would appreciate that. Our kids have been learning scripture through Luther, which I'm thankful. Um, so Luther's asked, introduced two verses now, John 3, 16, and then Romans 5, 8. So this morning I had some kids come to me and share Romans 5, 8 with me, and that is such a blessing. My man Judson down there nailed it. He had John 3, 16. He nailed it, and some other kids had Romans 5, 8, and I'm thankful for that. I am intentionally wearing jackets now. It's not because I'm trying to look good. It's because I need pockets, man. Um, so, and I don't want to carry a pocketbook, so there you go. You know, I got, I got suckers, Tootsie Pops for these kids as they memorize Scripture. And uh, I'm trying to encourage that, and uh, I want to. And they can, like, every Sunday, man, kids come tell me a Scripture verse, and one that we've done or not done, I'm going to hook them up with a sucker. Um, and uh, because I, I want these kids to learn Scripture. So they, they can use the same one every week and just, just keep saying it out. And um, I'll keep getting suckers or something. So anyway, praise the Lord. Um, his mercies are more. His mercies are new every morning. I, I pray that um, you have a wonderful rest of your Valentine's Day. Let's stand and let's sing that chorus one more time as we go out. <laughs>